all change has to be intersectional. And we have to think about it that way. So today we're talking with Lumumba Seekers. Lumumba is a PhD candidate in organizational behavior at Harvard Business School. And his dissertation research focuses on how women and racial minorities collectively organize around their identities at work and try to make their workplaces more inclusive. So thank you so much for joining us today, Lumumba. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Lumumba, good to see you again. Great to see you as well. Thank you. So Lamoma, you've, you've actually written a little bit about um, leadership because there's a big push, uh, especially in the tech industry, to get representation mm -hmm. into leadership. But that is not necessarily, um, that doesn't solve things. It's not a silver bullet for sure. Um, tell us a little bit about the complications there. Yeah, that's actually, and there, so I recently wrote this article with Lakshmi Ramarajan called Blacks Leading Whites in this broader book. Um, about race, work, and leadership that came out that was edited by Laura Morgan Roberts, Anthony Mayo, and David Thomas. And in this book, like, there's this fundamental kind of tension that we think about, which, which you alluded to, where like representation, we say, isn't emancipation, right? Just because you're getting more people there doesn't mean you're actually kind of like dismantling the structures that are leading to these inequalities. And one of the key problems is that if you look at organizations and we think about who was in charge, especially in these predominantly white organizations, the same issues, the same traits, the same characteristics that might make somebody rise in, in this company, particularly a black person, are not actually the same things that will make them want to more broadly challenge inequality. And so let's think about this for a second, right? And so if I'm in a company, if I have to be a leader, right? Leadership is both granted right? People have to give it to me and say that you're going to be the leader and then I have to accept it. Okay. And so I have to say, yes, I want to do this. And so we built this theory, what we call of dual and mutual identification. Basically we say that as a black leader in this predominantly white organization, I have to want to stay in this organization if I'm going to be a leader, right? So if I'm, for example, let's think about even at HBS, like I have to stay, I want to be in this environment to a certain extent. Um, so, right, and so there's an identification, I can be here. But then also, if I want to continuously challenge inequality, a part of that is me thinking and still identifying with black people as a black leader in terms of people who have been marginalized in this and saying, not only do I want to stay in this environment, but I have a strong identification with the people who are marginalized within this environment. And so that's going to give me motivation, two different types of motivations, motivation to access resources and motivation to use those resources to challenge inequality. Now we say that once I'm here, and if they're the white majority in this organization is saying, you know what, we think you're a leader, you should progress, right? That, that is that mutual identification. But once you get up there, we talk about that there are four different types of leaders. There are the leaders who have, and, and we base this basically, you say there's this black leader who has identification with the white majority, wants to stay in the organization, wants to challenge inequality. Then we look at how do people look at him? And so you can think about the black leader to the extent that they can have identification from both the white majority and the black minority in the organization. We actually say that they are more likely to be able to affect more lasting change, more systemic change, because the people in power are saying, yes, you can stay here. But also, we don't often think about this, is that that black minority is actually, they can protect them more. There's much more of a sense of like, we got you, we have your back and you're, you're one of us. And so you can't just like get rid of that person. So I study employee resource groups in my dissertation. There are these groups of people um, around a particular social identity. So it'll be like a women at or a black at, something like that. And one of the black ERD members was talking about a black leader saying, we have to protect this person. We have to make sure that they know that we have their back. And that's important because that gives that person a little more uh, breathing room right? I'm not on this hype rope. I don't have to just do what the people in power say I have to do. That if I kind of step out on the limb, there are people who are going to be here with me. That's important. And that's where you kind of say representation isn't enough because you might have people up there rising, but they may not have that same identification with the people um, who are still marginalized in the company. And that's something that companies have to think about. It occurs to me, I kind of, I'm thinking about the right way that it matters right then how that say that black leader 
positions themselves in relation to like the black employees, right? Because I can imagine that an ERG, you know, say, you know, the, you know, black at whatever the company is, um, ERG is, you know, probably more um, interested and willing to say, hey, like, we've got your back, we want to support your leadership, if they feel as though that leader is invested in them, right? Um, exactly. If they sort of don't feel like that leader is going to bat for their needs and interests, then they might say, well, you know, we're, we don't really, you know, feel like this is uh, something that we have such a strong stake in. So it just seem, seems like there would be an interplay there. Is that right? That's exactly right. And this is what can, this is what can be confusing for people who just think about representation. They're like, oh, we gave you this person. <laughs> Why aren't y'all happy? And they're sitting there like, uh, that's not really a person who's on our side. And we use this quotation from Zora Neale Hurston, all my skin folk ain't kin folk. And, and that's important to think about. So I think a lot about slavery. And I think about a lot about slavery and, and capitalism and the relationships within organizations, especially if we think about how much of our interracial relationships are based, came, came out of this slave. Um, master-slave relationship. And one thing I think about is that if you take a, um, a very kind of hard stance, if you say, to go to the extreme and think about a plantation and think about like leadership on a plantation, if you think about their enslaved people, their masters, then slave people aren't saying if we could only have more black overseers, we would feel better. The context, there's something structurally wrong with the context. And so if we look at a lot of our companies, and if we say that the way that which we've engaged in practices, we've talked about external to the environment, internal, if we say there are structural issues, there is racialization, there is this white standard of neutrality, we talk about there's a standard of, of man being the ideal type, that you can't just put people in, in places and not look at what is the structure of these work relationships. And, and yet, and yet the structures are put and kept in place by the people who organize the company or found them. So we end up at a bit of an impasse there. Any, any advice for that? Is, are we just waiting for founders to wake up or do we need a different system? I wouldn't say wait. I don't, you're not, if we wait on people to wake up, that's going to take a long time. I think you can persuade people. I think there are some people, I think there's variants, right? There are people who just don't care. There are people at one extreme who say, I don't care. I want to make more money the way that I need to, to make it. Then there are the people who are going to say, look, if there were a better way, I would be happy to try that. And so I think that's where some of the persuasion comes in. If, look, there were a better way, and you have these founders and say, can I start? And that's where you say, look, you can't wait to do diversity, equity, and inclusion once you start making money. You have to kind of bake it into how your strategy as a company and say, look, we're going to be an equitable place. That means we're going to have to take more time in how we think about hire people, hiring people. That means we're going to have to constantly be challenging our assumptions about who can do the work and what type, they can, what type of work they can do, where they can do that from. So that's once another set of people. I think there's another set of people who doesn't have the access to the same resources that most um, founders have had. And you actually have to say, how can we activate those people and make sure they have resources to start organizations that we haven't imagined? Like I'm in the, I'm in the business of, of scholarship, right? I, I, I do research for a living. I'm, I'm creating new ideas. Like fundamentally, it's a creative task. Like, and so when I think about the knowledge that we have now, Every paper I read, I'm like, oh, that's something we didn't know. That's something we hadn't seen. Like, I think the same thing is possible in business, right? There are people who will create new farms, new things that we haven't seen or imagined. We just have to make sure that they have the resources and that they're able to use that creativity. So I think there's a lot of talk about persuading those who have power, but what about providing people without resources a chance to actually build their own power and to self-determine for themselves? And I think that also has to be a part of the discussion. Um, you mentioned, you know, pipeline before people worried about pipeline, but it's really about what's happening inside organizations. There are actually some people now looking at what's happening inside of universities. Um, I know, um, you know, I know there are a couple of different programs. Uh, Northeastern in particular has one called the Align program. It looks to people who are typically underrepresented in computer science and actually has master's degree programs for people who actually don't have undergrad STEM degrees. Because they realize like, well, the pipeline hasn't served these people well, but that doesn't mean that they don't realize when they're a little older or a little more mature, um, you know, like, wow, I can do this. Um, mm -hmm. So providing the opportunity there is really critically important. And providing the opportunity, but also saying that you can do something different. If we, we can't just say, all right, you have not had access, 
and we are going to assimilate you and make you good enough to fit into this program and to fit into the system the way we've thought about doing things that has structurally marginalized people like you. Now, you, you individual, you come through and you be successful. That actually doesn't change the nature of actually communities and, and groups of people that are being marginalized. You have to also say, all right, you can come here and how are we going to learn from you? And what type of creativity and what types of new insights can you bring? And I think it's almost a larger scale, kind of if you think about Robin Ely and David Thomas's work, this idea of integration and learning. It's like if you almost think about taking that out of the context in which they study within teams and organizations and think about an intervention for communities learning, where it's like, we're not just gonna say, come in here and do what we want you to do. We can actually learn and you will bring new insights, not because essential, not because like there's some essential difference between us, like there are no essential biological differences between races or people across um, or people of different genders, but because you have had like different social experiences, can we kind of open the way that we think about the world because you are, are coming just from, from a new perspective. And so that type of thinking, I think, opens up for new, create, for new ways of creativity for people to say, all right, this is how it's affected me and people like me. How can we think about engaging in a new way of doing business, a new way of building organizations, newer ways of building communities, not just, oh, we're going to let you into, you know, the Harvard Business School or to Northeastern and we're going to just let, we want you to do what we do and we want you to get good at what we're good at. When what we has been good at, to be quite honest, has been perpetuating the same systems of hierarchy and marginalization. So we actually, maybe we want to be able to learn from the people who we're bringing in more than just making them do what we've always been good at. When I say we, I'm talking about institutionally, looking at some of these universities as well. So I, I want to use that to kind of segue a little bit to this idea of changing organizations, right? Changing the system, changing the context, and kind of give you an opportunity to share with us a little bit about the, um, you know, research you did for your dissertation and, and what you found, right? So as you said before, it, it's on these employee resource groups. Sometimes the, they were called affinity groups, right? But it's these, you know, women's networks or black employees or um, Latinx employees. And they're pretty prominent in the tech sectors, so like big companies pretty much all have them. Um, so I just would love, you know, for you to tell us a little bit about what you found. What are these groups doing? How effective are they um, at actually changing organizations, making them more equitable? Um, what are the challenges they're facing? Um, um, so would love you just to, to share some of those findings with us. I went into a couple of companies and I looked at just their black and their women and their Asian employee resource groups. I focused on that. And right now on my dissertation, I'm focusing on the black versus the women group. And, and it's just in one company. And what I saw really is that one of the things that shaped what these employees were doing was actually that th their relationships with the leaders of the organization were actually very much resonant with the historical and cultural power relations between white men who were the main people in charge of the organization and white women and white women were the main group within the e within the women erg and between white men and black people and so what does that look like so i found that actually the women erg had this relationship with the organizational leaders of dependency whereas the black ERG had this relationship of deprivation. And what this looked like was that for the women ERG, there was actually this, the, the well, first of all, nothing happened for a while, then scandals happened as they do in tech. And then there was this, all right, let's start pouring in resources to the, after the sense of threat. So let's acknowledge that like both groups were being ignored. <laughs> at first. And then so when the resources started to come in, there was there's more resources within the women ERG. And there was a lot of talk about also like this familial dependence. We can't do things without men. We need them. We need allies. A very much like we have to get allies in here. And there's a lot of talk about allyship. And but at the same time, the white men in the company, as they got more as they gave more resources, they also were able to co-opt what the ERG did. And they were like, this is what you're gonna do, like what's effective. And the women ERG had to, you know, these were the goals, this is what we want to do. So there was this kind of tension in the sense that they were dependent on these resources if they wanted to do much. I think both ERG started off with these two broad goals. One was a sense of emotional and psychological safety. Right? Can I? This is a safe space where I can just come in and check on other people. I want to make sure that I'm not the only woman feeling this way. I want to make sure that I'm not the only black person feeling this way. 
right? And then there was also advocacy, where they wanted to advocate and change the company. I think that this relationship of dependency really shaped the women ERG because it became less about are we advocating or are we feeling safe, but more like, all right, how can we get allies involved and how can we show like opportunities for women to be successful within this particular system? Again, not changing that system. They're dependent on these men who are in charge of the system for the very resources. And what I then saw in response was what I called collusion in the sense that white men, women, actually, white women actually prioritize the relationship with the white men in power in the organization and actually deprioritized other women of color, particularly the black women in the group. And so you saw this collusion, we have to get allies and allies are important because we're not alone. But when you asked about, oh, what about, how do you think about like the racial issues that black women in the group are having? Oh, well, there's a black ERG for that. Or, you know, that's not really. And so you saw this juxtaposition of prioritization and deprioritization that actually, and I call this latent privilege based on race. And a lot of times we think about privilege as this thing that is actually invisible or latent, but I really highlight this latent because you're talking about a group of people that was being actively subordinated. They were being actively marginalized within this company. It's still tech, right? Um, and to combat this marginalization, they were getting access to resources, but a lot of that was shared through their shared racial privilege with white men. And so there was this prioritization of like, all right, we can kind of pool these resources together as long as white men still control the resources, but we have access to that. Now let's take that aside and look at the black group. The black group was often deprived of resources. And it was like, well, we're not gonna deal with these black issues. They're not relevant. We're not gonna really talk about this, right? And so as the black group was trying to do stuff, they often felt like that they were, then their goals ended up being dismissed. And so you have them trying to talk about, these are the issues we're facing and people are like, why are we talking about that? That's not relevant here. And this is even after the same scandals. And there was a, both a gender scandal and a race scandal where this kind of dismissal of racial issues as important, which we again often see in society. And so in response, whereas the women ERG was mostly white women colluded to maintain this access to resources, you saw the black ERG separating itself. And they tried, they was like, you know what? We're not getting any resources. What we can do is create a safe space. And what the black ERG then actually ended up doing was really like creating and maintaining this private chat room where they could support each other. And even their office hours, they talked about it being a safe space away from white people where they could actually, actually speak honestly and candidly. And I call that a sanctuary. And then within that, you saw black women actually, they were being marginalized in the women ERG. And then in the black ERG, there was still some sexism as well. And so what did they do? I, I saw them actually build an inner sanctum within this black ERG, where they were still involved, but they were centering both their race and their gender. Ultimately, as I said, the, the black group's goals were dismissed, the women's girls, group's goals were co-opted. And so they both were able to do certain things, but at the end of the day, the actual structural issues in the company that maintained the racial and gender hierarchy were actually went unchallenged. And that's that lack of effectiveness that you often see, is that there might be some reprieves from the inequality through these groups, but these relationships actually end up minimizing the actual effectiveness that can happen because those structural relationships remain the same. All change has to be intersectional. And we have to think about it that way. So if you're in a women's group, it can't just be like, all right, let's figure this out and let's be on the same accord. And then let's like deal with this later. It actually has to be like, how do we deal with this complexity? How do we deal? And not just the complexity, a lot of times people say, you know, all right, well, you know, white women face certain issues and then women of color face these issues and it's different. It's not just different. There's actual racial harm that's happened between those groups and between those people that has to be accounted for. And so in my data, I see um, black women not just saying, oh, we're treated differently. Or, it's not that it's irrelevant. It's actually that they've heard white women say very harmful racialized things and racist things within the, con within the context of their relationships. And I think the same thing will be said within the black group. It's just not that black men and black women have different experiences, is that we have to be conscious of the actual patriarchal elements that have been in how we organize and how we relate to each other. And so to create more effective spaces, you actually have to deal with those issues, to deal with those tensions, to deal with the marginalization and complexities within groups. And so one way is thinking about intersectional spaces. And that does not, and what, and I think subgrouping is a way to deal with that. So I think the fact that black women create the subgroup within the black ERG, but are still members of it and, and a part of it 
that's super important. So instead of saying have your own separate thing, that gives you a way to share resources, but to also create space of learning and safety and growth and development within those spaces. So that's one thing, is, is it allowing that complexity to be a part of the groups, not just allowing it, centering that complexity um, um, in a way, in a part of the group's goals and missions and making that a part of it. The second thing, and this is really for organizational leaders, is that in order to actually help people create these more equitable systems and organizations, you have to allow a level of self-determination that, um, that is beyond what we normally see. So for example, in one of the situations that I talk about use co-optation, I talk about this white male leader who was, the, the, the white woman was talking about how he was a great ally and he was, you know, making sure that they were, um, you know, on top of their professional or clean. And, she, and then she gives this example of them having this listening session and he's saying, all right, this isn't effective. We need to do something else. We need to do more things. And so in one, in the, in, in the kind of early reading of that, it's like, oh, okay, he's just helping them be more effective. But the problem is actually is that he is determining what is effective for this women's group. Whether or not the outcome is the same is kind of beyond the point for me. It's the fact that he, this man in charge, is determining what's effective for him. And so that relationship actually has to be different. Um, people in charge actually have to say, you know what, you need this space. How can we support you with resources and how can you do what's important for you? Now, that doesn't mean that you're gonna get, always get a separate answer because again, a lot of us have been socialized within these same institutions, within these same contexts. So there's, and that's where like this intersection and that work has to get done too. But if you allow these groups to self-determine more, provide them with resources without trying to control them, and then the groups themselves take a much more intersectional approach of saying, all right, who is most vulnerable in this group? And how do we make sure that they can succeed? Then they can do that work without also saying, all right, how do the white men in charge, how are they gonna feel about this? How are we going to make sure that we still get more resources next week and we can deal with our stuff as well? So there has to be this letting go, but supporting, and then a, a chance to also deal with these intersectional complex spaces. It's interesting that there may be a parallel or at least something tech companies can identify with, which is that in technology companies, and this is through sort of my own personal experience, um, there can be organizations that give a lot of autonomy to people inventing technology. Um, and the groups feel very empowered to say like, oh, we're gonna invent something that doesn't exist. And, and, and there's a reasonable level of tolerance for leadership to let those companies, uh, let those small groups explore. Um, and I just wonder if there's any way for organizations to see the parallels in um, sort of along these lines. I think one of the challenges with technology is what people feel is the hypocrisy of the field. I had one person I was talking to in an interview. She said that th it's like, we can do all this other stuff, but we can't innovate here. And like, it's supposed to be this very innovative field, but when it comes to race, gender, when it comes to hierarchy, it's like, oh, we don't know what to do when it's hard. It's like, it's hard. You said you do hard things. Like, that's why people came to work with you. Do hard things now. <laughs> and so, yeah. and um. So the idea that it's too hard for like companies that bread and butter is saying that they solve hard problems is like completely hypocritical. And the, um, the employees often recognize this. And so what you're saying is something that I think is, is just a way of thinking about, all right, this is how the industry works. But like, then the question is like, why is it so different for race and gender? I think there are, are true reasons because that these organizations, again, are very comfortable um, operating within these structures of racial and gender hierarchy. And so, but I think if we can move past, if we can like attack that head on, not move past it, but attack it head on and say, all right, this is how we deal with complexity in these other ways. How can we incorporate it here? Because again, at the end of the day, it is an organization and you are working, you're not just meeting up with friends outside of that. And so there has to be some sort of compromise or balance of like, all right, we are employee resource groups, how are we contributing? But what I'm saying is that you have to then bake in some sense of, like you said, autonomy, some sense of like, all right, self-determination for people to also say what's important to us. And then to say, all right, then where's the mutual kind of importance for the company? But it can't just be like the people in charge want this. And we have to make sure that we're gonna do this in order to get resources. And if we don't do that, we need to like kind of hide because we're afraid 
because a lot of times people get scared when too many black people get together in a company. People start getting nervous with too many women in a conference room. People start making jokes. They're like, ah, you're not gonna, you know, those nervous jokes that are always inappropriate. Um, and you, you see that. And I think that just explains the psychology of that sense of threat. People in charge of companies have to get beyond that and say, let's not be threatened by you getting together, but let's, be, let's support you getting together so that we can actually come up with new ways to be um, the, the, to actually you know, embody these ideals that we, we say we believe in. It goes back to what you were saying Lumba, about trying to adopt this integration and learning you know, paradigm or a learning mindset, right? So for the company, when they you know, see you know, employees gathering around, you know, around kind of solidarity around their race or gender, instead of viewing that as a threat, viewing that as a resource and say, oh, well, they're probably gonna come up with some ideas that teach us about how we can be a better organization, right? It's like just a, a learning mindset. I yeah. just underscores your, your earlier point about that. Exactly. And then sometimes just saying that even if they don't come up with ideas in that meeting, like we know that we're an organization that exists again within this external environment that is, and, and like we've made money and built in this environment. And sometimes they're going to need to get together to process what it's like, like just dealing with this. So, and, that, and that's what I mean. It's like that balance of like, yes, there are, there are times to think of instrumentally of what we can do, but then there are also times to just process and allow the space for the humanity of people. Um, a lot of people come together within these groups. They just want a sense of dignity because that's been denied in the company and outside of the company. So we wanted to ask you a little bit about just how you came to this work, right? So you're a scholar of race and gender, a scholar of inequality, trying to understand how that operates in organizations and uh, how we can change that. Um, you're doing this work at a business school and just curious about how it is that you ended up at HBS and um, how you think about the goals that you're trying to accomplish with your work in the context of where you're doing it. I would say that I never thought I'd be at Harvard Business School, right? It wasn't something that I was applying for. I... Didn't, I didn't know organizational behavior programs existed um, until maybe like five months before I applied. And then I was like, and the only reason why I applied to HBS is because Harvard has this weird thing where the organizational behavior program was joint with the psychology and sociology department. I didn't know it was because Harvard just says only like FAS or can give out, um, the faculty of arts and sciences can give out PhDs. I was like, oh, okay, it's done with the psychology and sociology department, so I won't just be at the business school all the time. I can talk to some people who think about inequality. That's the only reason. So I only, or, so HBS was the only business school that I applied to, because I was just like, I'm not, I can't be in a business school, like that's, um, so I applied to, but I cared a lot in my application about not just doing the research, but like, how is this research going to be used by people? Well, even once I got to HBS, I was like, what is this? Um, <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time my first kind of first year, year and a half, but two things changed I th in my second year. One, I took the course with Robin Ely, um, and I was like, oh my God, yes, this is amazing. This is, <laughs> you are thinking about this. And then I went to the gender um, work conference symposium. I was like, all right, these are my people. These are people who were thinking about these issues. They are here. It's not perfect, you know. Um, but there are people who are thinking about this and I'm not alone. And I think that opened me up to the world of some of the scholars who are doing this work around race and gender in this field where, um, but it took me a while to find them, find them. And there was a lot of time at first where I was like, I don't think I should be doing this. And I think like most grad students, we always, I, I also have the times where I was like, maybe I should, this is, this is too slow. The, um, inequality and hierarchy and, and anarchy is moving too quickly and, my typing is moving too slowly. Um, but I think a lot of times it's also kind of, all right, where do I fit in? What are some of the skills that I have and how can that contribute to the change I wanna see? And to me being able to like step back and, and think kind of rigorously and slowly and be able to say what's going on here. That's what I've also really come to appreciate. That's what I loved about my research process of doing these field research was it wasn't like, let me come out and give you an answer real quick. It was like, there are lots of people thinking about that way, but if I can step back and actually be able to think and not have the, the people that I'm thinking about controlling what I think about, right? Um, that to me was what I needed because as much as I talk about these controlling relationships in my data, like there's this, like the people that are controlling them, I feel that and it's hard not to feel that. Um, even in this field, you know, I'm a black man, not just talking about race, I'm also talking about gender. And so that's a part of who I am. Um, 
and shaped me because I have somebody who I have to th- I have to not only check how am I doing talking about racism is okay, but also have to check and see because of me I know somebody who's participated in patriarchy myself and has had to check myself and I've learned a lot and I'm grateful for the people who have helped me learn and grow. And I think as I do this work, I try to also take that growth mindset for other people. And that shapes my ability to look at the imperfections at a place like HBS and in a field um, like it is and say, all right, where are the opportunities for growth and development? And how do we understand this, this better? So our final question is just sort of what you might like to leave folks with. Uh, you know, For those who are thinking about these issues, want to be change agents, resources, things to read, what advice do you have for people? Yeah, I would say there's so much and people are talking about a bunch of books and podcasts. So I'll just give one, just so you can focus on one on one thing. And I mentioned earlier the book that I have a chapter in of the Race, Work and Leadership book, which is edited by Laura Morgan Roberts, Anthony Mayo and David Thomas. But the reason why I recommend that book is not just because there are a bunch of chapters by different scholars, but it will also introduce you to more scholars. And then you can also follow up on their work um, that they're doing. So I think that book is a great entry point into thinking about race and leadership but also I would encourage you as you read their chapters to also look up some of their broader work as well. Lamumba, thanks for being here today and for your perspectives. It's been really great speaking with you. Thanks so much for having me. It was great to be here. Thank you for joining us, Lamumba. This has been a really um, fascinating and also inspiring conversation. We really appreciate your time. That's a wrap on the interview, but the conversation continues. And we wanna hear from you. Send your comments, ideas, and suggestions to justdigital at hbs.edu. You've been watching Pathways to a Just Digital Future, an investigative project that aims to better understand and address inequality in tech. This program was produced by the Harvard Business School Digital and Gender Initiatives. Our team includes Ethiopia Omadi and my cat, Tanya Flint. One more time, Liz Sarley. Thomas Jamie Dayo. I'm Dave Homa. And I'm Colleen Ammerman. Thanks for hanging out with us. Keep exploring at justdigital.hbs.edu.